Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to the webinar, Going to Work or on Vacation, Mobility in a COVID Context. And I'm Garrett Clark, the Sustainable Living and Lifestyles Program Officer at UN Environment. And today's webinar is the fifth in a broader series, Sustainable Living 1.5, Empowering People to Live Better and Lighter. This broader series in the COVID context explores people-centric approaches to sustainability. We've all seen the importance of putting people at the center in how we build back better, whether it's at global, regional, national, and local levels. And we've all seen it in our own homes. Recently, Google noted that during confinement, when most of the planet was affected, that there was an increase in the number of searches around the term sustainable living and lifestyles. But the real, uh, there was an increase of over 4,500%. But the reality is that people do not wake up in the morning and strive to save energy or resources or think about the environment. They don't necessarily think about hurting it, but not necessarily about helping it either. Though there is more of a growing awareness and certainly with COVID-19, there's a growing concern around health and well-being. And most likely, most people who are on today's webinar are quite concerned with the topic itself. But people make decisions about their lives. They get up, they get something to eat, they get dressed, they plan their days to get to work, school, or take care of their family. People make decisions, and now more than ever about health, they make decisions about what they eat, how they move, what they need to procure, financial concerns, and spending time with family, friends, and in their community. Basically, they live their lives and aspirations as best they can for themselves and their families. And today, the challenges even to survive for many are even greater than ever. Let's remember that the evidence is clear that there is not one sustainable lifestyle nor one perfect sustainable lifestyle. Living more sustainably in Paris, Bangkok, Nairobi, whether in an urban or rural setting varies. And even those who want to live more sustainably probably don't have the options that are affordable, accessible, effective, or desirable. The evidence is growing about what we can do in our daily lives to scale up the positive impacts to live healthier, better, and lighter. And that's for everyone. And there's a critical role for governments and business to make sustainable living the default option. And that's the purpose behind this broader series. It bridges the world of sustainability, which many can understand might be filled with concepts, terms, or actions that may not be accessible to the average person. The series is there to help better activate people for sustainability. UNEP developed the series in partnership with many different organizations and people, including the programs from the One Planet Network, which include leading experts in sustainable living, and sustainable living covers the core domains around food, mobility, housing, and leisure, working with governments, researchers, educators, media companies, and influencers. And we welcome you to join the movement. Now, before going into the few slides I have that will introduce the webinar today, I'd like to give a big thank you to the Stockholm Environment Institute team for hosting today's webinar. I have to say that the One Planet Network program, the Sustainable Lifestyles and Education program, which is co-led by the, the Stockholm Environment Institute, has been a very strong long-term partner, not only in producing this series, but in working together to support sustainable living around the globe. So to give you, before going into some of the other specific webinars coming up, you see here the categories of the webinars that we have. They're looking at the evidence behind what are sustainable lifestyles, whether it's economic and behavioral science data, looking at what are existing good pra best practices for replication, 
and taking deep dives into how we live and how we can live better and lighter. And finally, looking at what are available tools and resources that can be used by policy as well as change makers. Now, to further entice you to check out past webinars that you might have missed or to look at the future ones you don't want to list, let me show you what's coming up in October. Can I have the next slide, please? Be sure to look into how changing how and what we eat, who can lead the way, is a deep dive into the food domain. And looking at the end of the month in Tell Me More and Maybe I'll Do It, Consumer Information for Better Decisions. All the information you would need about the past as well as present webinars are available at the link below. And you'll find the recordings for today's presentations as well as the webinars itself. Now, the final slide, if I could have it, to give a brief overview of the, the way we'll be spending the next hour and a half. I'm delighted and honored to have Rob DeYoung, who also works at UNEP, who will be introducing and moderating our expert speakers. And then he'll be moderating a discussion with the public at large. So with our speakers today, we have two who will be talking about the mobility context from different global perspectives. And we'll also be looking at trends in tourism because whether it's staying closer or staying longer and buying better, tourism plays a key role when looking at the overall global mobility issue. So with that, let me turn the virtual floor over to Rob DeYoung for the rest of the webinar. Yep. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody, wherever you are. Welcome to this webinar and thank you for joining us. So today we're talking about, as Garrett said, mobility and sustainable lifestyles and living. Just building on what Garrett said, every day as we wake up and we start moving out of our bed, we make choices. Are we taking the stairs down or are we taking the elevator down? Are we walking to work or are we taking the bicycle or the car? How do our children go to school? Where do we groceries and how do we groceries? And visiting friends and family. But also, my car is old. Am I going to buy a new car? I don't, do, won't I need a car anymore in the next coming years? And on vacation, take it, do I take the train or the airplane? And how often will I go on vacation? All these issues are choices around mobility. In all these issues, you have more sustainable and less sustainable options. But obviously, it's not only up to us. We need to look at what are our possibilities. You don't want to send your, your children to school if they risk their life doing so. You don't want to buy an electric car when it's double the price of a normal car. And taking the bus nowadays with COVID also has its risks. So we also need to look at who, who can help us. What do we need to take these sustainable choices? What are the requirements for us citizens to take those sustainable choices? And who can help us with that? Who should take the decisions? Are we looking at our fellow citizens? Are we looking at municipal leaders? Are we looking at the private sector, the national government, or even the United Nations? So we need to make sure that all the conditions are there for us to be able to live sustainably, and to be able to move sustainably. And this is something we want to discuss today. What do we need for sustainable mobility? The World Health Organization estimates that every year about seven to eight million people die prematurely because of air pollution. About half of that comes from outdoor air pollution and a large share of the outdoor air pollution comes from vehicle emissions from the mobility from the transport sector. At the same time, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is stating that in the future, one third of all climate emissions, energy related climate emissions, are coming from the transport sector, growing faster than any other sector. And to meet the Paris Climate Agreement, by 2035, the world should only be adding zero emissions, i.e. electric vehicles. We're still far away from that. But we've seen some glimmers of hope and we see some trends that are allowing us to be more sustainable in our mobility. We've also seen COVID. We've seen that it is possible if we massively move to walking and cycling, air quality in our cities can massively improve. So we need to talk about what do we need to be able to have those sustainable lifestyles. I have a panel today that is from all over the world. I've got with me Chris Cost. He's coming from Africa, working on Africa. I've got Christopher from Australia. I've got Claudia from the United States. And I myself currently are in the Netherlands. So we have a very wide group of, of people.
that are going to touch on these issues on very different perspectives. But coming back to the issue, what do we need for sustainable mobility? So without further ado, I would like to start with our discussions. The Q&A center is open. So feel free, as from now, to, uh, to ask your questions, uh, make your comments. Uh, you can address them to all the panel members. You can address them to me. You can address them to anybody you want. Um, but fill them and I'll look at them and we come back to them after the presentations. We have three short presentations. And I think Chris, you're with us now. So we start with Chris Cost, right Ian? Chris is good to go, good to go, very good. Chris is there, Chris Costa, he's the Africa Program Director for the Institute for Transportation and Development Policy. And like me, he lives in Nairobi. And Chris, um, my question basically is, do Nairobians have those possibilities? What possibility have these people in Nairobi to move sustainability, to, to move sustainable? What choices do they have? Chris, over to you. I think I was still muted. Now, can you hear me? Great. So yeah, thanks Rob and, and to the rest of the organizing team uh, for putting this together. And yeah, I think that's the key question. Um, you know, we, we really need to see if if people can use these modes. Um, if, you know, if, if they want to travel sustainably, do they actually have the facilities to do so? Um, can, can you also confirm if you can see the slide? Thanks, great. So, so let's look at that. You know, I think the, the first thing I, I want to point out is that if, you know, when you look at most African cities, people are already using sustainable modes. So the vast majority of trips are by walking, cycling, public transport, and we only have a small minority of people using private cars. Uh, it's 13% it's in Nairobi, um, also 13% in cities like Lagos. In, in Mombasa, only 3%. Right, so so people are traveling using sustainable modes um, for the most part, but the real question is, you know, is it easy to do so? Um, the other thing I, I would point out is that the you know lockdowns and and that happened in the Africa region really varied from country to country. So in a lot of countries, it wasn't the full lockdown that we think of in in the European context. Um, you know, in, in this is the graph from Nairobi. You know, you can see that a lot of activity only dropped about forty percent at the peak of the lockdown. Um, and, and so most people still had to move around, you know, given the informal economy that we have. Um, you know, the, the definition of essential worker is pretty broad. Um, and so people had to move, they had to face the, you know, COVID along with all the other mobility challenges that normally exist in, in Nairobi. And so this is the challenge that, that the pandemic has really brought out. Um, you know, we have footpath, you know, this is a brand new footpath in Nairobi. You can see it's already undersized. You know, they're, they're, people aren't able to practice physical distancing during the pandemic. They have to walk in the middle of the carriageway. You know, that's how we're designing our streets. And it's, it means that our cities are not resilient during a pandemic like this. And then there's some streets that don't have a footpath at all, right? And so you have caregivers trying to move around with their children. Um, it's very difficult, right? And then we've been seeing, you know, we, you know, we, we've, we've been in all, all the cities that, around the world that have really moved to cycling. And in the Africa region, a lot of people have also, um, you know, picked up interest in cycling. Um, but then you don't have the facilities to use. You know, we have cycle tracks um, designed like this in Nairobi. Um, you can see the issue also like this. And you can see that there's no shortage of funds. You know, there, there are, you know, many, many lanes for cars on this road. Um, but the cycle track isn't being maintained properly. Um, so, you know, we know what can be done. We, we've been seeing the, the construction of the pop-up bike lanes and shared streets around the world. Um, many good examples and, and cities are doing this quickly. You know, they're not taking time They're You know, Paris builds these bike lanes overnight and, and the next morning people can go out and, and ride safely. And so this is the kind of transformation that we need to have also in the Africa region and it can be done um, this is Jogo Road, one of the busiest um, and most dangerous streets for pedestrians and cyclists in the city. And, you know, with a simple intervention like this, we could, you know, roll out a pop-up bike lane and, you know, provide people a safe place to ride um, during the pandemic. So this, this is the kind of intervention that we need to pursue. And I'll give some examples on, you know, on walking and cycling. There, there have been a lot of positive moves. Um, you know, Uganda has been a, a good case where the president got behind the cycling agenda pretty early on. 
um, and you know really stress the need for people to you know to to cycle as an alternative to um, to other modes. And and so there was a you know there's a boom in bike sales and. Um, you can see the the articles here. And then what also happened, you know, because of this high level political support, the agencies also started getting behind it. So, you know, the, the Uganda National Roads Authority started designing, redesigning their upcoming uh, projects with bike lanes. And, and so this is really, you know, taking on new meaning, but it all it all boiled down to that initial political support. You know, when when the agencies knew that they had that backing, from the president, they were willing to, you know, put the extra funding, you know, spend the extra time to update the designs to make this happen. Um, a lot of cities are, and countries are working on street design manuals in the region. So this is the one in, in Kenya that's currently in draft form. Uh, Ethiopia is also developing a manual. Um, Uganda is working on NMT um, guidelines. You know, so these kinds of efforts are needed so that we have a uniform approach and, you know, when we get it right, we can reproduce the good practices and not go back to the old way of doing things. Um, and, and then Ethiopia has also, you know, really taken a strong stand on in support of non-motorized transport. Um, here you can see the transport minister launching the 10-year NM NMT strategy that the country adopted. And, and now they're setting up a non-motorized transport council that will be an interdisciplinary body comprised of all the different agencies that are involved in different parts of the planning and, and design and construction and maintenance of the NMT environment, right? And that's the, the sort of holistic approach that we need if, if we really wanna change the picture. So that's, that's non-motorized transport. And then let me use the, the last few minutes to talk a bit about public transport. Um, because, you know, as I said, you know, in many African cities, public transport's been running through the whole pandemic. You know, operators have had to face the, you know, the, the severe challenges um, and, you know, and threats to their health and well-being. Um, and it's, it's, it's been tough, right? Um, you know, there, there, there have been, you know, there's been a lot of back and forth between enforcement agencies and, you know, and the operators. Um, in a lot of cases, the 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 physical distancing measures and and other, you know, COVID measures have been just you know put in place as sort of penal uh, regulations. You know, we'll we'll fine you if you don't you know carry a lower load, or you you have to do this, you have to do that. And what a lot of members in the industry are are raising is that you know there's other the economy, so why not public transport as well? Um, because there's plenty of money going into transport. Um, you know, it, these are the kinds of investments that we have in, in many cities across the region. But instead of supporting the, the operations of public transport, it's going into physical infrastructure. And it's going into infrastructure that's primarily designed to move more cars and to move them at, at faster speeds. Um, and, and most of these new roads don't have provision for public transport. And and so and and the, it, also when you increase the speeds, it's much less safe for people to walk and cycle, you know. And I think that's a theme that we'll be coming back to throughout this webinar. You know, we we have to manage our vehicle volumes and speeds if if we want things to be safe. Um, you know, this is just a, you know an example of the kinds of ongoing projects that don't they don't have the bike lanes, they don't have wide enough walkways um, for us to you know to practice physical distancing. So we really have to change this this approach. Uh, here's an example of, of, you know, a city that's been, been you know, following a slightly better uh, design practice in Dar es Salaam. You know, there are wide walkways along the BRT corridors. There, there are continuous cycle tracks. The public transport is given priority, um, so you can, you, you know, you can carry more people on the same fleet. Um, it's also easier to, to reduce the, the loads because, um, because the, the operations are more profitable, right? And so that, that helps. Um, you know, mitigate the, the loss and profitability that operators have been facing during the pandemic. Um, and then after all that's done, then you have some space for mixed traffic. So, so that's the approach. And then besides physical infrastructure, we really have to think about how we're going to transform the business model in public transport, because most of our public transport in the Africa region is still operating on the, the target system, as it's usually known. Um, or in the more technical lingo, the you know a net cost contract where operators are, you know, collecting the fares and, you know, whatever uh, people, you know, whatever the conductor and driver can collect from from the passengers, that that directly affects the income that they'll take home at the end of the day. We have to move away from that, from you know, from a a, a system where 
fares are paid into a trust fund, and then operators are paid based on service level um, you know, factors. And, and so this can help transform the operational model. So instead of having compensation based on you know, number of passengers, it can be based on the number of kilometers traveled. Right, so this can reduce the pressure on the road, the competition on the road, and and also make it easier for operators to comply with public health directives. You know, so the the occupancy rules, like other uh, things that have gone in, in in you know in during the pandemic. Um, right now, the the incentives that are there go directly against um, you know the interest of maintaining public health because the drivers you know have every incentive to load more and more people on the vehicle. Right and and to save money by you know cutting cor corners on vehicle sanitization and and other uh, you know other measures like that. So we we need to look at a better business model if we really want to have a long term solution to the challenges we've been meeting under the pandemic and also in general. Okay, and let me just leave with a you know a couple of uh, you know examples of of more transformations. This is the the city center of Dar es Salaam. Um, on Morago Road and how it was transformed completely from having all that parking, all the cars, um, to having wide space for pedestrians, cyclists, and public transport. And we can do the same thing in, in all of our cities. Um, this is downtown Nairobi. You know, we can transform it to have a more equitable streetscape and, you know, and, and really promote health and well-being um, coming out of this very challenging period that we're in. So I hope that can spur some discussion. Thanks a lot, everyone, and, and we'll talk more during the Q&A. Thank you, Chris. Uh, very interesting. Also happy to see all the good examples. You say it's not a matter of not knowing the solutions. The money is there. The good examples there, we can do it. Still, yeah. it's not happening everywhere. There's already questions in the question box. Um, you know, people walk for economic reasons. We will come back on it. I'm not going to ask you to answer now, but I'm definitely going to ask you to answer this later. Why are we not doing it? If, if it's so simple. And, and so, but let's move on. Um, we miss, uh, move on to Christopher Warren. He's the director of the International Center for Responsible Tourism. He's based in Australia, and we're going to talk about choices, mobility, and tourism. Right, Christopher? Over to you. Hi. Hello, everybody. Um, I suppose the question we might all want to know is what has happened to leisure mobility during COVID? Uh, what can we learn from the dramatic changes that have occurred? And how can we make sustainable tourism mobility more effective? What I've noticed uh, really so far is that there's been a lot of confusion um, in terms of the what's available to people and what's safe to use. Uh, and there's been a dramatic change in the fortunes for potentially in the fortunes of uh, domestic tourism. But are we ready for a change in tourism flows if we want to become more sustainable? So uh, first of all, I'm going to run through some slides that are designed really like a dashboard. So um, I'll let you come back to these slides maybe one day uh, when as this is being recorded. I'm not going to go into all the details, but I'm going to give you a summary. Tourism is a highly complex system and the context changes around the world. So this is a very generalized presentation. Thank you. Ian. So the first slide we're going to talk about is aviation, because when people think about tourism, think about flying everywhere. If we look at the little graph at the top, uh, it is rather small, but it actually summarizes an enormous change, or as the International Civil Aviation Organization describes, a collapse in aviation, an unprecedented change. And so you see those little arrows, those indicate things like SARS or the financial crisis. And you can see small dips in the number of people who have been flying. And now you can see a ginormous drop in the number of people who have been flying. If we move to the left, you can see uh, the map of the world and you can see the percentages of international and domestic uh, passenger or capacity, I should say, in those different regions. I'm splitting international and domestic because that's really the point of my presentation today is if people aren't going abroad, where are they going uh, and is are they going to be more sustainably mobile than they were before, perhaps? 
Um, the pie charts at the bottom, the darkest shades indicate the share of uh, domestic uh, flights, passenger numbers against international for those different regions. And you can see quite significant changes, mainly in Lat uh, Latin America, North America and Asia, big drops in uh, domestic, but equally in Europe, Middle East, big drops in international visitors. What does this mean in terms of numbers? We're talking potentially of 2.8 billion less passengers between uh, January and December this year, with half a billion less in the first quarter of next year, which means that aviation companies are losing $420 billion. Now, when start, uh, COVID started, people were talking about maybe a two, three year recovery. I've been very optimistic to suggest a four year recovery because the scale of this and trying to restart something is very difficult. The uh, graph beside that on the right is showing the scale of intra-regional flights um, and passenger numbers in Europe, which is 79%, Asia 79%. So a lot of people fly around their own region and that's something we need to focus on. There have been some innovations and I'm trying to uh, uh, like Chris showed just in his earlier presentation, some lovely positive stories. I have been trying to wrestle to find some positive stories. So I will just point out there is some innovations occurring. You might not think they're innovations, but they are certainly new in a change. It's a change for an airline not to pack everybody on a plane, but to put a, a spare seat between people. They're offering free insurance and pre-COVID tests for flights, which is quite a significant change organisationally for these all these businesses. Next slide in. Uh, while we wait for him to tell you the next slide, I just uh, let you know that the aviation in China has gone up to 90% of what it was doing before. Trains, we saw a big drop, 40% drop in Sweden, 90% in France. We saw the TGV's uh, passenger numbers to 7% during the beginning part of COVID. It has become back with government support, financial support, but there is still some inconsistency, some pressure points. For example, in Italy, the Italian government asked people to run the train system with 50% less passenger seats booked, but obviously there's a huge pressure from the tourism sector to because they wanted the flow of tourists. Um, Obviously, one of the great things about driving uh, from a visitor's point of view is it's in their own safe little bubble. And certainly use of automobiles hasn't really dropped as much in proportion to other forms of transport. And we've seen massive congestion in some areas where people are taking day trips, etc., to get out of the city. Interesting figures to compare the number of people taking their private vehicles on the train across the channel. That only dropped 28% in August compared to the previous year. Cruise industry suffered a lot of bad PR. It's, it's not necessarily a lot of people who are traveling, only 28.5 million, but it's a very important financial uh, sector of uh, tourism. Um, and they are going to fight to make sure they can get back because it's worth 150 billion a year. Now on the right, the innovations besides sharing food and brightly colored trains and retrofitting trains, uh, we're coming back in places like Australia, where I live, where the staff have been told to reduce the number of passengers, but obviously that means they've had to develop an app for them to work out how to do that. Interestingly, the cruise lines are using, this is an innovation, that they're actually reducing the number of passengers by 30% and therefore having a higher staff guest ratio and presenting that as an innovation, as a positive. They're introducing body, uh, thermal body cameras and laboratories on board. They turn them almost into, dare I say, to hospital ship. So there's big mm -hmm. changes. The point I'm getting across here is that change is possible. Resistance and revenge. People are resisting traveling. A lot of people aren't sure where they want to go. Do they want to go very far? Scandinavians are quite interested, perhaps if you're Danish to go to Germany, if you're Norwegian, you go to Finland, but people don't want to go too far, too far away from their home area. There was increasing fears during the summer of traveling by ferry or by, by a plane. People are confused. They're bewildered by all the choices that they've got and trying to calculate the risks. And so they are being more persuaded when there is insurance or flexibility or more knowledge or even discounts. But there is this pent up demand, which they call revenge tourism. A large number of people, over half in the US and 
China are prepared to rebook. People are desperate to get out. And I'm seeing that where I live locally, a huge number of bookings in this region are up by 50%. There's so many more people want to come here, but can we cope with that volume who are all driving? Next in. So let's just look at the pie charts and say, well, before this is a, an illustration of the split between international and domestic trips. We always think about tourism very much from the point of international, but domestic trips are by far the largest share. But they've certainly gone down as less people want to travel. But will it grow back to what it was? And if so, what proportion? Certainly international travel won't grow in anywhere near the scale. If we look at the left, the economic reasons are quite clearly that people can't afford to. Unemployment, reduce income and so on. So budget conscious travel will prevail. Countries are losing substantial money, amount of money of inflow. And some countries like Fiji and Venuatu, who are dependent on tourism, are desperate to have people. While other island nations in the Pacific are actually saying, maybe we don't want tourism anymore. While there is some return to domestic travel, as you can see in the graph with China and America, if the dips, every time the COVID figures go up, the passenger numbers dip. Psychologically, people want to get out, want to reconnect and want to help the communities, but we aren't ready for it. So that photograph is from Queensland in New Zealand. There were so many New Zealanders wanting to go to the snow fields, some of them had to walk. So if we are going to have a huge influx, you know, where's the infrastructure? Thank you, Ian. So on the left, we're talking about rail. Next year is the, the European rail uh, train of the year. Um, and uh, that's a great opportunity because there's going to be substantial investment, but we still only have five to 10% of trips that are cross border. And we need, we need to sort out the ticketing, et cetera. If tourism is really going to opt away from the convenience of a flight to go across many nations to travel to your destination. Um, so that's a big problem, even though people are prepared to take longer trips by train now, and so are business travelers. What's interesting is that chart in the center, which is from the Department of Transport in the UK, showing during the COVID period, the um, difference in use of different modes of transport. Certainly bike use went up compared to the beginning of February, but petered down as people returned to their cars. But trains did poorly and still do poorly. Yet, from a point of view of innovation, we see with the Austrian bike system, which is outstanding, where you can ride along and stop and have free access to tools to repair your bike. We still have problems where we need to make accommodation available for people who ride a bike so they can store it at night. We have cross-border uh, tours, which are great, but we need to work on those further. While we did encourage people to go and use the train with their bike, in Belgium it went up by 80% in June. That was because the bikes were allowed to be put on the train for free. Thank you, Ian. So my point to you is this. We need an integrated sustainable tourism mobility approach. We need to recognize that holidays are a great opportunity of breaking that habit of using a particular mode of transport that you've always been doing. If we can persuade them, if we can talk about the benefits to them and if we can show them how to do it. Now, my hub and spoke is simply a range of different modes of transport, but integrated with the attractions, the accommodations and the facilities. So we can share schedules, rides and ticketing. Key is we need to consider, can these mobility options that we need to be moving people to, can we make them increase the visitor desire, anticipation and happiness of their holiday? And by so doing, can we improve the immobility of local communities and their quality of life? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ian. So my last slide is to talk about a One Planet project which I'm doing, which is called My Green Butler. It's a software system for accommodation providers. I'm interested in talking to destinations where we can provide this to link in to local transport facilities so that when you get off the bus at the appropriate location, you can hire that canoe or go walking. We need to integrate this and communicate it back to the visitor. We need far better relevant communication and with QR codes and updated information through the day, we're able to provide that now. Thank you for your time.
Thank you, Christopher. Very interesting. Um, you quantified what we all have been seeing going on around us. And uh, your last question is how can we make sustainable mobility options more attractive? I can already see some very interesting suggestions coming in in the Q&A box. Yeah, some uh, very drastic. So keep the questions coming and uh, we come back to them uh, after the last presentation. The last presentation is uh, by Claudia Arizola Stell. She is the Deputy Director of the Urban Mobility Program and she's Director of the Health and Road Safety Program at the World Resources Institute for the Ross Center of Sustainable Cities. Claudia, I think you're based in Washington DC, right? That is correct, Rob. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. I don't think I'm seeing your presentation at the moment. All right, let me try again. And if not, we can just go with the presentation you have. There we go. There can we you go. see my presentation? Great. All right, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Thank you very much uh, for joining us today. And I'm going to talk about what is happening with mobility post COVID. And I'm going to put my lens now a little bit more in Latin America. Um, very good. So are you seeing that I'm passing my presentation, right? OK, so this is Bogota, Colombia, and uh, this is pre-COVID-19. You can see uh, congestion and uh, nicely on the left side, uh, the BRT lane with the space for public transportation as a priority. Few months later, this is the same avenue El Dorado in Bogota with basically very, very little traffic. And this is something we have seen across Latin America. Uh, when people went in lockdown, the streets were absolutely empty. And as a result of that, the speeds were going up and the risk was increasing as well. We have average speeds that rose in Cali, Colombia, especially at night. Citywide average speeds in Bogota rose to 38 kilometers per hour, 25% higher. In California, 87% more speeding tickets. In New York City, 288% increase in peak hour speeding tickets, twice the amount before the pandemic. What is that for us? What is that good or bad for our cities? Well. Let's try to understand a little bit more what speed means for us. And this is a um, graphic that was made in uh, Sweden when they were working around um, Vision Zero. And what this um, you know, cartoon is showing is that if anyone will make a mistake in this road and we have, uh, let's say, a 50 kilometers per hour speed limit here, that will mean that the vehicle hitting that pedestrian uh, is going to be comparable as falling off a cliff. It's something that our perception cannot really manage very well, uh, but it's extremely dangerous to have speeds that are very high. And here, this is one, again, to help us understand the dangers of uh, speed at 30 kilometers per hour, a person that is hit by a vehicle is comparable as jumping from the first floor. Still 10 to 20% of people will die hit at that speed. If we go to 50 kilometers per hour, that is comparable of jumping from the third floor of a building and only 20% of people will survive. So our bodies, our human bodies, are very vulnerable to a speed, to kinetic energy. So we saw speeds going up and we also saw a lot more people taking the bikes, which for people that care about the sustainability of our cities, the air quality, uh, equity, this is great to see. But 
we are also seeing that it's not even for everyone. If you see in this analysis here uh, done in Colombia, uh, in Bogota, you can see that there is a big difference about women and men when it comes to different aspects of why are you cycling or not. In terms of uh, safety, for example, women worry a lot more than men. Cycle lanes, infrastructure for cycling need to be safe if we want to attract women to bike as well. But this is a very worrisome topic. You can see that also men are concerned about it. 59% um, shared that that was a big concern. Uh, infrastructure aspects follow that. Uh, and again, you see women there uh, concerned about how is the infrastructure that they are giving me? Uh, weather plays a role in the length of a trip. Um, it's very interesting because women are not that concerned about the length of the trip, but they are very concerned about how safe it is for them. This is something else that we have seen, that vehicles, mass transportation, the buses cannot be packed full. So people have to start moving in something else. Um, and we are already seeing that motorcycles are replacing the bus trip. Um, look at this in Cali, Colombia. Before COVID-19, we had a 7% split um, in the motorized vehicles in uh, the city. And post-pandemic, we are not over with this, is 21%. It grew up three times. We have in arterial roads with the temporary bike lanes, bicycles uh, share went up to four times, which is the positive side of this. And in Buenos Aires, for example, the demand of public transit during the pandemic is only 28% of the usual. And this is what is happening in the developed world where we are seeing a lot of people trying to get even a, a used car. Uh, so this is going on the wrong direction. And, uh, you know, many years ago, we had this type of advertisement, right? It all starts with a dream and you see the little kid with uh, his bicycle just mesmerized by a luxurious vehicle. Uh, this is not what we really want. Neither we want this here, right? Um, this is amazing and also horrifying to see that you have kids really willing to bike to go to a school, but under those conditions that is not acceptable. So what are the policies that are urgently needed when we talk about um, COVID-19 and post-pandemic. First of all, mass transit is the backbone of our mobility system. We have to protect it. We have to start talking about how we are going to protect mass transportation. If at this point we only have in average 25% of use. Second, we need to control the increase of private cars and motorcycles. We have other ways to get around right now. People might need to continue working from home if that means decreasing the number of private cars. This has a huge environmental impact, a huge equity impact in our cities uh, and public health, of course. We are talking about air quality and traffic crashes. This is something we don't want to see as a trend. And finally, making cycling more safe, uh, safer and attractive. So we have to look at how the infrastructure for cycle lanes is being designed. In WRI, jointly with the Dutch Cycling Embassy, the Danish Cycling Embassy, the League for American Bicyclists, and uh, the city of Oslo, and all our uh, offices around the world, uh, have come up with uh, five principles. You can see here uh, the strategy at the top, 
where we say, look, we have to integrate cycle networks with the policy planning. This needs to be part of it. We need to consider the duration of the measures because a lot of people are putting just temporary bike lanes. We want to build the case for permanent changes. This can be a wonderful tipping point and we have to allow for improvement. Um, we have to be humble. We will not get it right the first time. That doesn't mean that it doesn't work for us. It just means we might need to make some adjustments. In terms of the principles that are going to make really cycling not the next pandemic, uh, is that we need to look at safe speeds. That's the first and the foremost topic that we need to think about. Cities cannot have a speed higher than 50 kilometers per hour, and then they need to plan accordingly because there is a huge difference to put cyclists in roads at 30 kilometers per hour than at 50 kilometers per hour. So the design has to be uh, properly done. We need to think about the network approach. Uh, once you allow cyclists to be in the city, they can go anywhere. So we have to prepare for that. Safe design, in particular, looking at intersections where they will have a lot of issues. We have to communicate. A lot of new cyclists will be out there and also drivers that are not used to having these uh, uh, cyclists around them and engagement. Get the community around and let's talk about how to make this work, management and enforcement. I'm not going to go to the key performance indicators because of lack of time, but I just want to finish this conversation by saying cities need to focus on the speed management, which is a very difficult topic for many of them because they try to compare a speed management with more congestion, which is a myth. It's not true and we can really do much better. A speed is a crucial factor to be able to have not only more cyclists, but more people walking in our cities, which is absolutely important for our health, for the environment, for our air quality. Thank you very much for this opportunity. I look forward to the conversation. Rob, you are muted. Oh, <laughs> sorry, I was muted. Thank you for letting me. I was talking away. I was saying thank you. Those were three great presentations, but um, you can see our panel members have already started answering uh, some of your questions in the Q&A uh, session uh, on the site. So um, very interesting questions here are coming up and um, I want to open up for discussion now. I may come back to some of those questions already asked, but I think I can open up for people that have questions now. Is that correct? So if you have questions, uh, please uh, let us know and I can open. I can give you the floor. In the meantime, as you are preparing to ask questions, um, I have a lot of questions already in the, in the, the box here. And uh, they are from everywhere, from Paris to Rio de Janeiro to Bolivia, Copenhagen, Colombia, Nairobi. Um, and I don't know if there's anybody of the anybody of the panel members who wants to do a quick response to some of the issue flagged. Uh, I'm looking at the organizers if you're ready to switch over to people that have a question. Chris. I see some of the people saying, OK, it's nice. Uh, facilities are nice, but these people are actually moving because, you know, it's for economic reasons. And the moment they get some higher income, uh, those nice people, those no, nice percentages of people walking and taking public transport will plummet and they will move to private cars. Do you think that's true? And what can we do about it? Those several people had that question. Yeah. That's a good question. And yeah, I think that's true. If we don't, you know, clean up our act and and start designing better facilities for walking, cycling, public transport, like that's exactly what's going to happen. And 
the the really important point here is that you know just as individuals you know need to play that role in in you know in, in making sustainable mobility choices like cities also have that choice to make you know we can choose which direction we go it's not inevitable that we're going to have you know 50 percent mode share by car in, in nairobi but it will be if we keep building all of our streets uh, solely for cars and without separate lanes for public transport without adequate cycle facilities without pedestrian crossings you know, so it, it's really a matter of providing the facilities and services so that people find it convenient to use public transport and to walk and cycle and, and not just to keep doing that because they have to for economic reasons. OK, thank you for that. Um, Christopher, there's an interesting question and I want to see if you have an idea and others jump in, please. And somebody said, isn't it time that people get an annual carbon allowance? And yes. so, you know, if you travel, if you want to travel to Hawaii, fine. But then the rest of the year you'll be eating beans only, you know? <laughs> I, I have to say, I think it's a great idea. Personally, I'm a big supporter of rationing. It worked before in history. Uh, I think people are going to get real. We cannot carry on as we are and we need to make choices. The trouble is that most people don't know how to compare apples and oranges as it were one thing against another and it's very difficult for them to make those choices if we gave people the ra a ration card that showed them how to do that and to make those choices i'm sure some would agree but there is a huge difference between those in the developed world those who are in first nation countries uh, and the lies that we have uh, against those that are struggling um, struggling with climate change. And we also need to consider our responsibility uh, as humans to all life on the planet uh, and how we should balance that better. OK, I find this very interesting. Uh, am I? Yes, there I am. I find this very interesting suggestion. Claudia, I, I see some, some questions here and some people say it's a matter of changing our habits. The ball is in our court. And others say, no, 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 no. It's a matter of having the right infrastructure, reprioritizing our investment. Um, how do you look up on that? There are different people commenting on that. Thank you, Rob. Um, if we talk about the globe, yes, it's different. In some places, you have to change the habits. In some places, you have to keep the habits. Chris told us very clearly how people in Africa walk is still is the majority and in Latin America it's very similar. So we have to make sure that these people are not shifting towards more unsustainable modes of transport. But then you see what is what they have as a, a ways to move around. A father with a little kid walking um, on the road with vehicles going really fast. If I were that father and uh, I will have the possibility to build something to protect me and move, I will do it. If it is not safe, if it is not uh, pleasant to be able to do it. So I think the habits are there. We just have to build the environment so that it is really good for people to do it. Uh, people in uh, Copenhagen, we had a question there, Rob. Um, they said they bike because it's the easiest way to move around. They are not thinking really that much about the environment. It's just because it's easy, it's uh, faster probably for them to move, it's cheaper, right? And you feel great about it. Um, how do we get these characteristics in other places? Thank you. Yes, I think. Uh, yes, I think the, the 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 person from Copenhagen said, "I'm very happy. I can have so many choices. I have options to choose from." I think this is all what we have been emphasizing in our presentations. We need options to choose from, right? We need more options to choose from. There's an interesting question, I think, and somebody made a good point here. And I'm, I'm just opening up to all three of you. And Garrett, jump in if you want. Um, you know, the question is: We're we talking about citizens and their behavior and their choices. So we're talking about governments and providing infrastructure and facilities. What about the private sector? What about the industry? Do they have a role to play in sustainable mobility and making our cities more sustainable? 
who wants to take this question of the four of you? Well, uh, yes, they should be, but it's um, it has to be supported with grants or financial incentives. It's got to be supported with legislation. It's got to be supported with proper interlinking with other modes of transport. And overall, I think we've got to move away from this concept of cattle trucks to back to what travel used to and can be, which is a far more I've used the word poetic experience, far more enriching experience rather than cramming everybody into some sort of vehicle and everybody trying to get lost in another world with their headphones. You know, we, it should be fun. Uh, I don't think that's a bad aim to, to go for. Claudia, making transport more poetic and we talked about the role of the private sector. What do you think of that? Um, the private sector is absolutely necessary. The innovation that the private sector has will never be comparable to what other organizations can do. They have that force, the entrepreneurship is very important, but it has to be paired with the objectives at large. A company will have objectives of profit, which is absolutely okay, but is that what we need for our societies. Um, so that's the balancing act that we have to make, right? And give the private sector really the right objectives that we want to arrive. We want to have better air quality. We have to have equity. We want to have safety. We care about sustainability. These are the last 10 years that we have to reverse climate change, to make it more, you know, livable. So under that space, please create whatever, you know, it will be better for us. Uh, but we have to put some games on the on the table. So Chris Cost, so Claudia says, as long as we set the objective, the innovation will come from the private sector. Do you agree with that? I, yeah, uh, I agree. I, I hope mean, I summarized it yeah. correctly, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, I agree. Like the 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 issue right now is that the you know if you if you take up public transport, you know the the incentives are not aligned with a lot of the outcomes that we want to get for society. You know, so the the incentives that an individual driver faces are not the same ones that we'd want to see overall. You know, to have safer movement. You know, to to have a service that's uh, reliable and frequent. Um, and so we we have to get those incentives aligned. You know, like like I was saying before. You know, oftentimes. Regulation of public transport is is just taken as a, you know, a, an enforcement issue, um, but it's very hard to enforce when the underlying incentives are going against the objectives you want to achieve. Because then you're you're you know you're going against the, you know, you're fighting an uphill battle the whole time, and and so and that's really come out in COVID because a lot of these same incentives that you know lead to, you know, reckless driving or overtaking, uh, you know, among our public transport systems. Are also making it harder to follow the the physical distancing um, measures and and other things that we're trying to put in place to to slow the pandemic. So it's it's really essential that we change those incentives. And then you know and and then the the private sector can play a, a good role in in bringing us to the solution. Okay, but now people are saying in the uh, you can hear me right? Yeah. Now people are saying in the comment box, um, actually post COVID. We've seen so many more people bicycling and walking, but it's chaos on the streets. Taxi drivers are angry. It's actually like, uh, resulting in congestion, actually more traffic accident because these bicyclists don't stick to the rules. It's chaos. This is not working. I think I start with Chris Cost again, but I will ask the others also. I mean, I, I think a lot of times that happens because we haven't provided you know, safe cycling facilities and so people end up biking wherever they can. And and so I think it, it again goes back to the street design and it, it's much easier to, you know, to enforce uh, the operations on our streets and, and manage the use of the streets if we have a good underlying design. OK, so infrastructure will solve it. Uh, Claudia <laughs> or Christopher, you want to say something about that? I'd like to offer something after they're finished as well. You can go first, Garrett. Oh, good. OK, I just wanted to jump back on that first round because you were talking about innovation and private sector. And I think that Claudia really touched on something interesting when she talked about we need to 
really look at what our actual needs are as opposed to the specific form of a car or a bus, et cetera, to do it. And when you look at a broader context around how COVID has affected um, mobility, is that there's a huge issue that hasn't been brought up, which is around teleworking, which in general, in talking about mobility, one of the asks that's always been there about what people can do is teleworking, but it was always one of the ones you had to work out and there was something you had to do with your company or come up with an approach. And now the reality is that pe many people are working distance. So part of the issue about innovation and finding solutions is going across different sectors or different uh, private sector support so that you can find a way of meeting people's needs in a, in a concerted way. Um, I'd also note something that in looking at how the private sector can help, given that this is a time of huge change in looking for new business models, is that the engagement of working with the business schools so that there's more of an entrepreneurial uh, focus around how they can start companies or ideas or innovation or co-collaboration on these new kinds of business models. Because when you look at the private sector and sustainability, whenever it comes down to real big disruptive change, there's always the question of what's the disruptive, what is the new business model we need? So I think we need to work on new business models as well. It's very good that you bring up uh, uh, teleworking. Uh, thanks there, Garrett. I read a study somewhere, the city of London is increasing its road investment uh, budget for, for, car, car, for cars 1% every year. And if everybody in London would work one day a week from home, they would have to, they could avoid that investment for the next 10 years and they would save literally billions of dollars by just having everybody one work one day a week. In addition to that, the, the, the congestion would be solved by itself. One day work a week, just in London. So I think it's, it's, it's a very good uh, issue that you brought up. Thank you. Anybody want to comment on that? I see not. I, I can only talk about it from, I'm only qualified to talk about it from the tourism perspective. So tailor tourism. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say that we've got serious problems in Europe on the train system where the, the process of ticketing, the process across borders, the ability to market those train services is so poor that we're not allowing the private sector to, to make as big a contribution as they could do and switching people from aviation to, to train. Um, and I just think that's something that needs to be sp speeded up. And I hope the EU does that in the year of the train and it stimulates that change. Yes, I can attest to that. Uh... Luckily, I haven't been flying any over the past month, but in the past, you know, those connections flying to Paris, to London, it's so difficult to connect the plane with a, uh, with, uh, with a, with a train. It just makes it impossible for, uh, for, for, for travelers, in my opinion. Uh, I think that's a good point. Um, so uh, anybody else who wants to say something about teleworking? So Claudia, I see your hand. Yeah, I think, um you know, we have not really internalized fully what it means to travel internally in a city. Um, everybody wants people to come to the office at 8.30 o'clock and, uh, you know, you have to be in the office. Uh, but what is the impact for that, right? We have congested um, streets. Everybody's going in that direction. Um, in terms of equity impact, people that live in the, you know, out the skirts of the city need to travel three hours, four hours in one direction to be able to be there because it's so congested. Um, so I think we have done a um, human experiment with COVID-19 that working from home works, you know, um, and we can do it. Now we have to really assess what is the impact and is that one day a week or is two days a week, uh, shall we really try to uh, pass some regulation where everybody needs to assess if the work that you are doing can be done from home and you don't need to take that trip. That will open up the space for cyclists too, for example. We need more space for people in the streets. Thank you. 
Yes. When I was asked to advise on the, uh, and I worked with Chris on this, on the, the mobility in the UN uh, compound, which is a large compound, headquarters compound in Nairobi, 4,000 people and several square meters. And they asked, do we need more cycling paths or do we need clean cars? I said, we need to work everybody one or two days a week from home. They never expected that answer. They already zoomed in into uh, building different park lanes or different parking or, or promoting different uh, vehicle types or widening the entrance, entrance gate. And, and so it's, it's an interesting concept. Um, Claudia, you brought us into COVID. You did it. So now we go there. And there's already a very interesting question that says in very, very large Indian cities, and I guess it goes for very large cities around the world, people depend a lot on metros. And how are we going to recover that now with COVID? What do we need to do to make sure that, um, you know, we keep those modes of transport? Um, Chris Cost, I'm quite sure you have an idea about that. Yeah, I mean, so one thing I think it's important to, you know, to, to say that, you know, we found that more of the evidence that's coming out is showing that public transport isn't necessarily the biggest um, super spreader. Um, you know, that it's actually much more the other kinds of indoor gatherings and things like that where people are spending a lot more time and with larger crowds. And, you know, and I think for, for everyone who wants to get more information, you can follow the Toomey uh, feed where they're posting a lot of information about this. And so, so, but that said, uh, clearly there's a need to minimize the risk on public transport. Um, and so it's a combination of, you know, making sure that people are wearing masks, um, which in, you know, here in Nairobi, we're not doing a great job of that. And I think that's the easiest way to, to reduce the risk. Um, and then, yeah, and, and we have to find ways to, you know, to offset the financial loss that, uh, that operators are facing. Um, because right now it's, it's simply going into higher passenger fares in, in most African cities. And, you know, whereas in, in, you know, some European governments are pouring billions of euros into, uh, you know, into uh, like into helping their public transport industries. So we have to see how we can come up with a more, you know, a sustainable approach to, to filling that gap, because right now it's, you know, it's falling on the, the most vulnerable people in society and, you know, and see how public transport can be part of the stimulus programs that different countries are putting forward. Thank you, Chris. Any comments on COVID and public transport from Claudia or Christopher? Just to reiterate what Chris has said, Rob, um, the air circulation in the subway in uh, New York City, uh, it goes 28 times per hour. Um, if you compare that to a restaurant, a restaurant might have two or three times air change in an hour. So it is a lot more dangerous. We still have to see if that is the case in other metro systems around the world, uh, but it is not really as critical as we have thought. That's the first part. The second piece is we gotta make mass transportation a priority in our policies and we need to bail out mass transportation. Uh, because if we let it work as the market rules, it's going to fail completely. But this is not a business of hamburgers. This is mass transportation, which is a core piece in our societies and how we access jobs and how we move our economy. Um, and we cannot treat mass transportation the same way we treat anything else that we buy um, in our in our lives. Uh, so it needs a very important discussion. It needs protection. It needs priority. Yeah, I can say that uh, we did some work with some partners and we found that very few of the bailout programs that countries have institutionalized uh, for because of COVID actually have a positive impact on sustainable mobility. Very many are still subsidizing uh, um, fuel cars, petrol driven cars, internal combustion engine cars, traditional infrastructure, etc. Uh, few have really advanced uh, and, and promote um, um, really sustainable transportation. Christopher, you wanted to say something? Uh, well, I can only say that at the moment, people living in the cities don't appear to want to visit another city. 
So they aren't adding to the, the general, they, but the problem that we've got is they want to go into the countryside. My observation is a sort of psychological thing is that when you when you live in the city and you're stressed out or you're busy uh, and you're traveling with your family or your partner, you tend in domestic tourism to arrive somewhere and want to consume tourism or tourism experiences at the same rate on a frenetic, busy Friday at work, i.e. people are not reflective, they don't slow down. So the first thing they do is arrive and go and either literally check off the list or mentally check off the list. They don't realise, hold on, I can just sit down and do nothing. And actually I could just walk, listen to the birds, look at the views. And I think in tourism advertising and communication and just social media, we would, it would be very helpful if uh, people started to communicate about traveling and if I use the word again, poetic, uh, in, in a bit more relaxed, then we wouldn't be driving around like crazy people and wouldn't be having the same footprints. So, you know, I think the point we're missing an opportunity right now because of domestic tourism's opportunity uh, we're missing the opportunity, the opportunity of linking some of the things we've been discussing to help break that mould. Because on holiday, it is a time where you can reflect and reconsider and reevaluate your life. And I think that we should not be using tourism now in the debate as a separate social occurrence, but as a tool to help us create social change that lasts longer. Okay. Maybe we don't have so much time left and questions are still coming in, but I think we haven't really touched on the issue of socioeconomic issues. And uh, I was once told uh, that uh, there was a new Minister of Transport in France and the, the journalist asked him the first question, he said, how much does a ticket cost on the metro? And he had no idea. So there's somebody saying here, you know, public transportation is seen as an indicator for class distinction. Who people take the bus, which people that they drive their cars, or even better, have their cars driven for them. Um, how can we break that? Are there examples where we are breaking that? Um, who wants to say something about that? Nobody? Steam trains. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Steam train. <laughs> Well, I'm mean? talking about on holiday, people will go and sit on a train and enjoy that. You know what I mean? It's it's making it attractive. It's not as a, I'm just going to repeat myself, but it's not it's it's not a commodity. It needs to be turned into an experience that enriches life. OK, experiences that enriches life, Claudia. Um, I would say people, citizens should ask the candidates that are coming for mayors or for ministers to write public transportation. Uh, and if they feel uncomfortable, as you are very well saying, Christopher, then they need to do something about that, right? Because they felt it and it's not nice to not be able to come out of the bus because it's so packed, right? Or you cannot breathe. If you are a short person, it's terrible. Um, the same thing for biking. That mayor needs to go and take a bike and see how are the streets. If we have our decision makers um, in cars all the time, their, their uh, focus on the problems that we are all living uh, is going to be so away, right? Uh, so I think people that represent us in cities need to represent who live there. The majority of people in our countries cannot afford a car. Um, so they, they need to relate to these realities. <clears throat> and, and if I could yeah, just complete. offer, could I offer a, an additional point? Okay, um, just to note, I really liked, um, Claudia made the, the conscious dis distinction between uh, policymakers and people. Well, if we look at another breakdown, if you look at youth right now, and you realize that youth right now, they're anticipating two to three billion new consumers are coming online in urban environments globally. It's no longer a north, south, developed, developing context. It's urban youth. 
And right now, when you look at what are the new transportation options, how they're getting around, it, it fits what people were talking about, making it cool. I at least can can reference where I live, but it's it's sort of the case in many places using using trottinette or scooters or getting around, making it fun, the business models that have come up about doing this. It becomes something that it's an experience to, to visit a city in that way, as well as to get to and from work because it's a short distance. And thinking about what are the new business models that, that can help benefit everyone, but also looking at this target group because these are going to be tomorrow's decision makers, whether they're in the private sector or public sector. So I think, I mean, I, I, I can't speak for the Chris's, but many of us who are also at an age where, you know, we may be thinking about cars, it could be a generational or age thing, aspirational issue as well. So taking into account, how can we mobilize the youth factor, what we've seen in COVID, how things are changing, may, maybe looking at family quality of life, some of these other comments, but I think it touches again the importance of mobility is certainly an important part of how we live, but it touches so many different ways in which we live. How can we tie them better together to come up with more of a well-being, safe and lighter context for how we're impacting the planet? Yeah, I, th I think that's right. And I think, you know, people aren't going to come and visit your city because you have a flyover, an elevated highway. You know, they're going to come visit because you have good public spaces. They're nice places to walk. Um, so we really need to think about how we can, you know, create value for the cities and, yeah, and, and get out of this mode of, you know, just purely focusing on the cars and, you know, and keeping them on the, on the top of the, the social ladder. And I think when, you know, the, the way that we allocate the space and the way that we manage the space really says a lot about those priorities. So if we allow cars to park on our cycle tracks or on our walkways, you know, then that helps to reinforce those social distinctions that, you know, that Rob, you were talking about. So those are some things we can change. Yeah, we're still designing cities to move cars around rather than to move people around, right? Yeah, that's right. It continues to this day. And and I think there's also a, a role for development banks. You know, development banks are continuing to pour more and more money into these car centric, uh, you know, designs, even though we at the global level, you know, every development bank talks about sustainability and, you know, have promoting green transport. But then when it comes to the actual projects that are being implemented, they're very different. So we have to make sure that the designs on the ground match up to the rhetoric. Right. And the design, looking at some other comments, uh, design matters. People talk about safety, people talk about gender issues, people talk about road safety, but as somebody mentioned also, they're getting robbed when they go over a bicycle. So I guess design is the number one issue that makes or breaks your your non motor transport system? For sure. I mean, having having a complete network um, so that people can move across the city and also, you know, as uh, as we were discussing earlier, you know, the speeds are the other factors. So you need to have your network, but then you also need, need to be able to cross the street to move through intersections safely if, if the speeds of vehicles are reasonable. OK. Um, we're almost done, but we touched a little bit on finance, and I think we talked a lot about infrastructure, and we talked about a little about about uh, you know uh, choices and 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 responsible behavior, but we haven't talked about much financing. Um, are we going in the right direction when it comes to financing the right mobility, or are we still seeing a financing scheme that is still going for the old dinosaurs, the the, the internal combustion engines, the the roads? Are we seeing a change there? Chris mentioned that he doesn't think that change is really there yet from the big financial institutions. On the other hand, I, I see some signs here and there that they start to realize that they need to change their investment. Uh, there's a lot of big companies that are now announced ahead of government that they will completely switch to electric mobility. Big, big, you know, uh, mail delivery services, but also other companies that are saying, no, we're not going to wait till 2040, by 2030, all our vehicle fleet and sometimes they're sizable are, are going to be zero emissions so you know i think there's some signs for that financing is uh, is going in the right direction but uh, i don't know uh, maybe i see too positive i don't know anybody else who did you see that it's going in the right direction but too slow we need to be bolder uh here you know we don't have another three or four decades to add um, so my question is, these financial institutions, 
are they letting people work from home to begin with? For example, we're talking about uh, that topic. Um, are they investing in uh, uh, what we call non-motorized transport, walking and, and cycling? It's so hard to move that needle. Why? If we see that that can have a huge impact. So it will be great to create the 10 principles that we see for financing sustainable mobility. And let's go through each of them and see if they are really making that um, that shift and at the pace that we need, right? Uh, so it's, it's positive, but we need to accelerate uh, sustainable financing. Yeah. Christopher, is the, is the tourism industry switching to sustainable tourism financing? Do you see that? Well, there's some examples, but it, overall it's not enough. I mean, my example of Austria and biking, it's great. But if the numbers of people continue to rise, the infrastructure won't cope. So it seems to me that we need a whole of government approach because tourism ministers of tourism are really involved in the promotion of tourism, not in the infrastructure to deliver tourism. And I think we need, it's more than just the design, we need to be able to empower solutions that bring in different government departments to design the right quantity of people at the right time and that we have the infrastructure that can cope with that. I mean, Claudia was mentioning that before about what are we actually trying to achieve. So people are attracting huge quantities of tourists at particular moments when cities can't cope with that quantity. Um, so I think it needs to be thought through. We need to be bringing visitors through the year, not just at peak times. And we need to be thinking about how they can be properly channeled through the city without causing, uh, you know, uh, delays for everybody else with all the coaches, et cetera, et cetera. So it needs to be properly designed, but it's not done at the moment. We're just thinking about the tourist visitor income and we're not thinking about the quality of life of the locals, which obviously it has substantial impact on. OK, that's I think very true and very interesting perspective. Um, maybe one of the last points here, there's a, a few people are commenting on the, the input, the importance of the real estate market in cities and how they drive, how we uh, move and how they drive or not drive actually, and that we don't move, but also, for example, the link with, with the value of real estate and working at home, real estate, I guess it's, it's a major party when it comes to, to urban, urban mobility. Chris, I, I it's key. Chris yeah, Costa, I, got two yes. yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, one of the main challenges in, in the Africa region, especially, is that our cities are, are sprawling at very low densities. Um, so the, you know, the, the, de the, the movement density on specific roads can be very high. And so there can be this perception that it's a very crowded city. But the actual densities are, are in most cases quite low, with a few exceptions. You know, maybe Nairobi, Cairo have their dense pockets, but most cities are are, are, are not dense. And so that, that increases the travel distances. It also makes the commute more expensive and it also pushes people to motorized modes, right? And so that makes us much less resilient when we're dealing with a pandemic like this because we're forced to get into a bus. Like even if we'd prefer to, you know, take this opportunity to cycle, uh, we can't do it. So we have to look at, you know, having much more compact development um, working on upgrading slum areas because a lot of times affordable housing projects purely focus on building new, very high-end housing, whereas you can you can have a much broader impact if you if you work on incremental improvements in informal settlements. You know, upgrading sewer lines, water lines, paving streets, and so on. So I think that's more the approach that we need to have if 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 you know if we're going to get this better integration between land use and the mobility system. Okay. Um, you know, I'm also from Nairobi and uh, in Nairobi, uh, the vehicle fleet doubles every seven to eight years. Can you imagine? So what you see now on the roads in seven years, it's doubled. You can't almost, it's almost unmanageable. And so we have to keep this in mind. In the Netherlands, everything more or less is stable and nice, but in Nairobi, they're struggling with huge, huge increases of mobility demands. Um, that's quite a different challenge. Um, we're almost at the end, um, 
And before I go and want to close, I want to go and make one round to everybody and ask them if you can briefly, what would be your top two or three, not more, uh, measures you would propose now when it comes to mobility and, and, and post-COVID? So um, what would you do top two measures from your perspective? We're now in COVID, uh, how we get out of there, specifically looking at sustainable lifestyle and sustainable uh, uh, mobility. Um, who of the three of you wants to start? Post-COVID. Claudia, thank you. Thank you, Rob. Um, I think I mentioned those three, but to me is we have to protect mass transportation. Uh, we have to have clear policies so that what is happening in Nairobi stops happening. So more motorized vehicles will not solve the issue that we have. We are right now at an inflection point. It can go either way, really. Um, and it's about what is the investment that we are going to put on mass transportation, on walking and cycling, that is really going to make the difference. So mass transportation, keep a close eye on what is happening with motorized vehicles, and please share the space with cycling and with walking. Thank you. Thank you. Clear? Which of the questions goes first? Christopher? Okay, well, I'm going to repeat myself. I think it's the need for integration of different transport modes at tourist destinations. So when you get off the bus, the train is there. When you get off the train, the tour guide is there, etc. so that people can actually use it and the frequency of those transport options make it attractive. Um, I think that we need to run campaigns to make it the social status of driving around in your own private bubble is a is something we don't want to stimulate. We need to have role models, leaders, as Claudia mentioned about mayors. We need people that others aspire to to be using public transport and be seen to be using public transport in campaigns and to ostracize more the fact that people are driving in vehicles is not something that we should be doing for the community. And finally, to introduce cultural and community activities on the transport systems so they are more fun for visitors. Okay, very good. Chris Cost? Sure, I might also be repeating a bit, but yeah, I That's think fine. number one, we, we need to we need to change the way we, we use our road space. We need to, you know, we need to roll out the bike lanes. Um, it can be done quickly. It doesn't have to take forever. Um, we we can use you know temporary barriers. Um, we we can you know we can develop a complete cycle networks, um, and we also need to have dedicated space for public transport. So so that's road space. And then I think we also need to work much more seriously on transforming the business model for public transport um, because for for a long time you know many governments have thought that this is just too complicated to tackle, and so let's just continue with the status quo. Um, but I think COVID-19 has shown us that that simply won't work and we really have to move toward a better business model that incentivizes the right type of service that we want to see in our public transport systems. Thank you very much. Thank you for, for joining the panel today. I, I want to just maybe end, and, and Christopher was mentioning also, with a nice quote that somebody just sent, the last comment we got, a rich country is not one where all poor people have cars but one where rich people use public transport. I think that's a nice comment. That's a final comment. I want to thank everybody that's provided comments. We've got very many. I hope we'll be able to cover to all, of, all of them. And I think uh, you enjoyed the interaction. I don't know, I've, Garrett, do you want to close? Have we come closer to sustainable lifestyles? I think that you did the perfect quote. So I think that that, I think it says it all. Okay, well, thanks all the participants, thanks all the uh, panel presenters, and thanks the Stockholm Environment Institute for organizing it all. I think it went quite well. And uh, so let's start all walking tomorrow. Bye-bye. <laughs>